Meditation is not what you think. You don't have to stop your mind from thinking, sit in any weird postures, or make any bizarre sounds. All you need is a little guidance, and after that, the practice will show you the way. I'm Dina Ropulu, a meditation instructor and creator of the One Fierce Heart podcast. And in each episode, I talk with experienced teachers and practitioners to demystify meditation, giving you practical tips on how to start, ways to face the challenges, while also acknowledging the transformative power and clarity that come with meditation. So please join us as we dive deeper into this mysterious yet ridiculously simple practice that's been around for over two and a half thousand years. So take a deep breath, let it go, and let's begin. I don't even know where to begin in introducing my guest for today, so I'm just going to share with you a brief bio, and then you'll just listen to this amazing conversation I've had with Minas Cafatos, who grew up on the island of Crete, and he is a member of several international academies of science with research in astrophysics, quantum mechanics, philosophy, and consciousness. He studies the true nature of things, focusing on consciousness in our human experience. He has about 340 referred publications. He's also co-authored more than 20 books, including the New York Times best-selling book with Deepak Chopra called You Are the Universe. Seriously, check out this impressive bio of Minas in the show notes. But I am so honored to have connected with him in real life. I've met him in person. He is such a delight to be around. He is this endless stream of joy and has an endless stream of ideas, an amazing sense of humor, knowledge, and he really embodies true presence. And I could go on and on in this introduction, but I'm just going to let you enjoy this very special episode. All right, so here we go. So I'm going to jump right into uh, a question here. And we know we have the human mind, and we also know that there is a universal mind. What is the difference, and how are they connected? So the common thing between the two, um, human mind and universal mind, is, of course, the world mind, um, which remains a um, mystery in science. Um, so we have to revert to um, philosophical or ancient systems um, that actually perhaps um, also give us uh, other alternative answers. Of course, uh, psychology um, today, and um, to a certain extent, extent psychiatry, but psychology primarily, um, as well as uh, quantum physics, try to tackle the issue of uh, mind and interaction between the, the observer's mind specifically and the, and the objects that are being observed. Um, but let me get to the point. The, the human mind, we usually think that it is in the, in the, in the skull, in the brain. Um, and usually when we say, where's your mind, people will say, they point towards their, their head and their skull, <laughs> like that. Um, but actually, if you, you know, if we do fMRI or any other of these modern techniques to uh, search inside the brain, um, inside the skull to, to look at the brain, the physical brain I'm talking about, there is no such thing as a mind. So this is very strange because we know the mind exists, but we cannot find the mind. So this is about the human mind. The universal mind, uh, various traditions that I was just saying, uh, such as um, the Buddhism, um, and um, of course, um, um, ancient um, philosophical systems of India, but uh, to emphasize also Plato, of course, in not necessarily the same words, they refer to this universal mind, which actually will then will 
perhaps say a few more, more words and use other words such as consciousness and awareness. Um, the, so if you take them together, there's two um, concepts which are very central, at least the human mind is very central to our experience of life. They seem to have common elements. As I said, the word mind clearly is a common word, but there are other aspects, such as um, the non-locality, we cannot find it, cannot locate it in a physical space, uh, the, the, per, um, the fact that it's outside, uh, from that, it, that it is outside of space and time, that it seems to persist, um, whether we are asleep or awake, um, whether we are walking or not being aware, even in non-awareness, let's say if we are in deep sleep, the mind still seems to be there. So this, um, there is this a lot more common things between mind and mind, between human mind and universal mind, than people are willing to to accept. So one of the questions then arises from from this what I would call fact that the two are so closely related is how come it's such a big problem <laughs> in, human, in human society? How come such a big problem in science? And it, for this, I think we have to look at um, the issue of the, what the ego plays, um, mm. what the role of the individual, or let's just put it individual. So, because sometimes the word uh, uh, ego is, as we say in, in Greek, a very many legs. In mm -hmm. other words, it's an overused word. So what is, what is um, that which is preventing us to clearly see the mind? Well, one of the issues perhaps, as the ancient teachings go, is that you cannot illuminate the mind because the mind itself is at the foundation of everything. So with that, we can, I think, proceed in our discussion. Maybe we'll explore it a little bit more. When you say illuminate the mind, um, you know, what do you mean? And also, what is this difference between consciousness and awareness and being aware and consciousness arising? So, mm. so illuminate the mind, let's take that, the first one, because it's a little bit easier. It really means to throw light, which means really to... Um, how shall I put it, to be, um, to throw our own um, way of looking at it, let's put it that way, we're just looking at it, quote unquote, um, let's not define our looking, but just basically we're trying to look at it, and of course we know from experience that you cannot um, look at something unless there is light. If it's a um, total pitch darkness, you may be aware that there's something there. Um, you may hear sounds, in other words, and you may uh, feel some things. But if the light is off, then you don't see it. So from that sense, the or illumination um, or the illumined mind, it means that um, we're using the cognitive um, tools that we have as human beings to try to study the mind. Well, in a way, this is mission impossible because if, if indeed the, the mind is foundation of everything, um, then it cannot be done. And perhaps this explains the inability of science and, in fact, um, most human systems, not just science, to get to the bottom of what the mind is. Of course, it doesn't mean that we give up. We... For example, we cannot describe uh, a red rose, um, but we know what a red, red rose is, right? If I can say, uh, Dina, you see this red rose that I'm holding, you know immediately what it is, but if I were to try to explain, it would be very difficult. So from that point of view, um, the mind is unexplainable, but it is something that um, 
not of substance, but something that is always in our awareness. So this leads actually then to the next question, the difference between uh, awareness and consciousness. So let me start with awareness and then we'll go to the consciousness. Um, in some ways, awareness and consciousness are similar to the human mind and the universal mind. Not exactly the same, but um, they're similar. So let me start by saying that awareness and consciousness are basically the same. Um, so that's good. Then one may ask why we use the words. And then the question is, why not? <laughs> there, must <be> some <laughs> there must be some subtle differences. For example, when we say snow, and snow, something that is very basic, or water and water, uh, the water that perhaps I describe now is not the water that it was five minutes ago, as the great Heraclitus um, um, taught us um, more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, water is water, but if you, as Heraclitus said, if you step into the water, you cannot step back to the same water because it changes. So in some ways, awareness and consciousness are the same, and at the same time, they are changing. When I say at the same time, I don't mean in, in temporal sense, but more in logical sense, in the sense that they are there, and yet they are not really there. So this sounds paradoxical, um, aware, but so we don't lose our um, train of thought. Awareness being a little bit more analogous to the mind um, has a lot to do with individual awareness, individual illumination, as we were saying before, illumining um, with, our, with our own thought, thought uh, thinking tools, whatever those they are, um, not specifying them right now, illumining um, more or less what we're trying to study, for example. Um, so it, it has an individual element, um, as the human mind has an individual element. Uh, on the other hand, consciousness encompasses the individual mind, so it's broader, it's bigger, bigger not in the spatial sense, but bigger again in the logical sense. Consciousness is more universal, or is universal. Um, the same way before we're talking about um, um, universal mind. And um, consciousness is perhaps at the foundation of everything. And then the human um, awareness or awareness are parts of it. On the other hand, as soon as we say that, then we realize that awareness is also consciousness. So uh, one is aware of something, including oneself. And um, one is conscious of something, including oneself. So at the bottom, um, at the base of both of them, in many ways they're identical, and yet they are different if you... Uh, approach them in this um, different way of individual versus universal um, way of looking at things. This is bringing me like so many qu questions and thoughts in my brain. You know, by trying to grasp the meaning of the mind, by trying to understand huma our human nature, there's this suffering that comes with it, or at least uh, this is how I've experienced it, and I understand a lot of religious practices, um, you know, and religions tell us and talk about this human suffering. Is it this need for us to understand and grasp the meaning of our life, grasp this meaning of our mind that causes the suffering how have you experienced this? And I know attachment is plays a big role in human suffering. Um, and having experienced you live as well in our interaction with TEDx Athens, um, I, I have to say I felt that you have 
you were not attached to things. Like you just really allowed things to flow. And I experienced this really, this lack of resistance from your part. So this lack of resistance, uh, this is just how I perceived it, right? Whether that was true for you or not, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Right. But this lack of resistance or and this existence of resistance inside me is what causes this constant you know, battle and back and forth. So I know I said a lot of things right now, but <laughs> um, what do you think of all Absolutely. that? All the, actually, all the things that you said <laughs> are right to the point. And actually, you touch perhaps a more central point and difference between awareness and consciousness. Because in some ways, we can sit here and, and talk about awareness and consciousness or human mind, the universal mind, and we can go on for hours and hours. But it comes down to experience. And um, so before I mentioned the word uh, ego, I said I would try to avoid it. But actually, ego is the one that we cannot avoid because it's at the center of, of everything. And it's the one that, um, if I may say so, pulls us down. So you're uh, really right to the point. And this is the central point, uh, perhaps, of our discussion that we have here, that um, what, um, what is um, the reason behind uh, this um, strange thing that uh, is called the ego, that if we analyze a little bit more, and actually that we can do scientifically, uh, I, may, mm. I may say a few words about that further down. Yeah. Um, what is it that makes the ego so eager to be unhappy. I know I'm putting it in a very, um, very simplistic terms, because of course the ego is also happy, right? So why are we concentrating on unhappiness? Well, because when somebody is happy, there's not really much to talk about. Right? <laughs> it doesn't cause an issue. <laughs> it does not cause an issue. But when one is unhappy, it causes an issue on oneself, on one's health, on certainly on people around one one person, all the loved ones around the person. So what you said that actually you experience um, what I was um, perhaps uh, projecting, or let me put it that way, at uh, TEDx and maybe interactions with had since then, it's not, it's not something that happened overnight, let me just say that um, uh, from the get-go. It's something that... Um, to be honest with you, Dina, first of all, and I still am puzzled by it, um, and I'm not kidding, I'm puzzled, how did it happen? Mm. And I can't really give you an answer, a straight answer, because I myself don't know. It just seems, if I want to find an explanation, scientific explanation, that perhaps, maybe because I have many years on my back, as you say, <laughs> or <laughs> I put a lot of effort, but but when I when I really dig into into those things, that doesn't seem to be the reason either. So the bottom line is that I really don't know. So that brings me back to our great friend, and I, I know that you and I uh, not just like but love, namely Socrates of ancient Greece, and of course the great philosophers. That um, um, the wisdom of the ancients that in many ways you experience in Athens. Uh, during the decks for sure I did, I think, I believe I did, and also some of the meetings we had afterwards uh, with uh, various people we were talking with. Um, the great Socrates um, said that uh, uh, one thing I know is I know nothing. I know nothing. So I said, well, okay, so this is the greatest philosopher or the father of philosophy and says, I know nothing. But then he added, and of course, it didn't necessarily happen that way, but we know that he also added, however, you have to make the effort. In other words, by saying, I don't know, or I have no knowledge, it doesn't mean that you get away. And then you can just, if you do want to get away, then perhaps what we are doing is, if I permit him to say that, is leave a life without awareness, perhaps a life that, um, uh, and I'm not here to judge anybody, but perhaps many people live 
because they themselves say that. I don't have to say that. Um, they, it's a life without meaning. And um, so keeping that whole um, issue in our discussion here, central to this perhaps suffering is what uh, Buddha, right? And mm -hmm. the founders of all, I believe, the founders of all religions and of all great philosophical systems were talking about the same thing in different languages. Unfortunately, the human ego or the human mind, the limited mind, took, took uh, what the great ones, let me just call them the great ones, said, mm -hmm. and put them in a kalupi, as was in Greek, in other words, in a um, specific mold, okay, that suits the ego. And um, that is a mission possible because then the ego can never be happy. And it goes from, uh, from question to question to question to question. And that's perhaps the, the source of the unhappiness. And I think that, you know, in the beginning of my um, journey of uh, trying to understand and reading, ego in the beginning was like, oh, it's this bad thing. But I'm starting to realize that I don't know if it's this bad thing that we want to push away, but rather I think for me, the question is, how can I befriend it? How can I coexist with it? With by being aware and conscious of it and understanding that separation, that I'm not the, the ego, but also this isn't a bad thing. It's part of me. Um, instead of trying to push it away, which is another form of resistance for me. So it's a little tricky. <laughs> you're, again, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because ego has this bad connotation. However, as you rightly observe, we all have it. So I'm not implying that the ego is just a bad thing that we get rid of. If that was that simple, like it was some sort of dirt, right? Then we'll find a way to clean that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would just get rid of it, yeah. <laughs> okay, rid of it. We'll put some soap on it over there. <laughs> some metaphysical soap or whatever, and uh, we'll get rid of it. But it's not like that. So it must serve a purpose. So mm. let me give a simple example, but it's actually, I think, uh, quite right. If we didn't have the ego, um, or if we didn't have a physical presence, if we didn't have the, phys the ego in the physical presence, let me put it that way, we walked out on the street, okay? And we didn't have the sense of even perhaps being afraid, which is not necessarily bad all the time, and we just were walking around in a busy street of, street of Athens or a busy street of Los Angeles, most likely we're going to be run over by a car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really take many brains to figure that one out. So right there, and then after that, there's no questions, we're dead, right? So um, the ego in some ways protects us, in, um, protects mm -hmm. the individuality. The problem is not the protection and not the um, good functions that the ego provides, but the misunderstanding that again comes from the mind. We said it at the beginning, and I'm going to keep repeating. From misunderstanding that comes from the mind that somehow um, this is it, and um, you know, um, there's nothing to know, and what is wrong with you? Why are you even asking the question? These are questions that many times identify with the ego, but I would say they're questions of the mis misplaced mind, the mind that mm. uh, self-limits or limits itself. So the ego is something to watch, but we don't have to throw it out, <laughs> throw it out the window, as I say, they throw out the baby with the dirty water. <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, we're both uh, meditation practitioners, uh, how has meditation played a role in working with the mind for you? 
So again, a very good question. Uh, meditation is um, is um, the centerpiece of trying to make sense of the mind. And I would make a daring statement that it's the only way. It's the only way to get hold of the mind because the mind is not. It's not really like a bull, as I say. You grab the bull by the horns. It's not like that. Although sometimes it feels that way, yet the mind is there, as you said, and the mind is not there. So the perhaps the only mm-hmm. way to approach it, and I think this is this is also your experience because we have talked about it, is through meditation. Well, also we don't want to just substitute one word for another. This is also something that people get turned off and say, "Well, okay, you talk about meditation, but you didn't really tell us about the mind." <laughs> And say, well, the the mind, really, I cannot explain to you. As you said, one thing I know is I know nothing. That's what the great philosopher Socrates said. However, you have to make an effort. And so this strange dichotomy between not knowing but making the effort to know, it's actually very much of our experience as human beings, right? Um, We, You can have a human being that is like Einstein or anybody, including us, that um, loves music, right? And maybe plays an instrument. And is also a thinker, or is a writer, or let's say in your case, um, a meditation teacher, in my case, perhaps a meditation teacher. And the two things are not the same, and yet they are part of our experience. So it comes down to the word experience. The problem arises, if I may say so, when we try to codify our experience, which are fleeting, and this is actually what Heraclitus meant, these experiences that flow like the water all the time, to codify them and put them in a, a, encapsulate them, let's put it that way, put them in a mold, and then say, well, that's the way it is. Unfortunately, to a large extent, this is what happens many times in religion, in philosophy, at the universities, at most um, human, um, you know, um, uh, different ways. Let's just put it this way: different ways of looking at uh, our outside world. I was, I wanted to say, different institutions and different modes of thinking. Unfortunately, this way of forcing a particular mode of experience, which in itself is very correct because it's an experience. But when you generalize and you try to exclude everything else, then it becomes a very, 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 I have to emphasize, a very big problem. I would say that's a basic problem. In terms of actual techniques for meditation, there are many. Mm-hmm. I think we talked about them. For me right now, just speaking for myself, meditation is really being aware of my surroundings. I, I just like to put it as simple as that because I don't want to complicate it too much. And this can happen with the breath. It can happen by sitting quietly in a space, closing the eyes, or not closing the eyes, but these are techniques. The main point is really just being aware of the surroundings, including my own self. So that's what meditation is. Therefore, meditation is, we make it more complicated than it really is, unfortunately, you know. And then we want to give degrees, then say, what is meditation? (laughs) And then people run away. They say, you know, you're trying to teach meditation from ancient India. Man, I, (laughs) is there some simpler way to really talk about this? And, you know, our fellow Human beings are right. It shouldn't be that difficult. So let me just stop at that point. And and that's how, you know, the that's how my mind works, I guess. It's like making things so complicated, even with something as simple as sitting in meditation, it has to my I have to make it so complicated. Like I have to, oh, I have to find the time. I gotta sit. I don't want I have a zillion other things to do. And then all I have to do is just let go and be like, okay, I can just sit here with myself for 10 minutes or whatever it is, but 
it's so interesting how the way I approach one thing, even meditation, is observing how my mind works with everything, making things so complicated. But at the end, simplicity is the best answer that I've found, like simple, simplicity. Great, exactly right again. <laughs> you mentioned a little while ago that you noticed that I was in a particular state and it seemed, things seem not to bother me too much. It's not the case that they don't bother me, you know, in, inside. Um, I'm a human being like everybody else. Yeah. I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a superhuman. Um, and however, perhaps um, this, this switch, and this is an important point, <clears throat> I think, for our, ourselves and the audience, this switch is to just let it go, <laughs> you know, to realize that, well, you know, what's the point? I mean, and I don't, by saying what, what's the point, it doesn't mean, oh, okay, I don't really care, I'm going to grab a drink and just go and have fun. It just means to let it go for, at the moment. Okay, say, all right, it's not to grab the bull by the horns, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that to let the bull run over you, it means to also avoid the bull. Okay, so we said before, it would be very silly of us to step in the middle of a busy street in Athens, singing great hymns from ancient <laughs> scriptures, <laughs> because probably five seconds or sooner, maybe sooner, we're going to be run over yeah. by a car. And then, <laughs> then what's the point of all of this? But to just, um, with meditation, is to um, sit down, relax, and let go. Let things be as they are. And of course, here that we are in a calm environment, we're talking in a nice way. It's not easy if you're in the middle of a crisis. I'm not trying to, to diminish the weight of crisis because um, human beings we go through crisis I have been through crisis I'm sure you have been through crisis and when you're in the middle of the crisis for someone to come over to you and say oh you know what uh, it's not oh, it's not a crisis and just uh, forget about it um, remember what Socrates said or something like that <laughs> that person will get very angry at you they say what do you mean you, do you realize what I'm going through right now and they would be right because we are not really in the shoes of another person so the only thing we can do is step back and maybe by stepping back it will help more the other person than trying to lecture them and say well or the or or let's say um completely um, say that what you're feeling right now is invalid, invalidate them, say, well, what you're feeling right now is invalid. Or to say that, well, you know, just um, go have a drink or, you know, don't worry about it, man. That makes the other person very upset because, well, you know, you're ignoring what I'm feeling right now. And they are right because by saying all these other things, we ignore the problem that the other person has and that, of course, perhaps is what makes a human being a human being, this compassion, this fact that we, we are together, we work together. And it goes back again to the ego. It's because the ego, where it rears its ugly head, and I said, we said, both you and I said, that the ego is not necessarily bad. But when it starts playing its tricks, mm -hmm. you know, um, you don't try to force it down and say, hey, egos. Shut up, you don't really exist. You say, okay, what is the issue here? And as you said, uh, for you, and I think also for me, it helps a lot if we say, okay, whatever it is, let me just, let's say, sit down and relax. And then as soon as people tell people to relax, people know what it is. You don't have to really write a, a PhD thesis about relaxing, you know. <laughs> so relax, and then maybe you can give it a technique that also people know. Follow your breath, or close your eyes, and don't, don't worry about it, your thoughts in the sense that, okay, look at your thoughts, but your thoughts come and go. 
and don't get attached to one particular thought. The problem is exclusion, when we are trying to exclude everything else um, from our uh, vast field of experience, grab into an particular set or one experience or one set of experiences and say that's it, because then we define ourselves through this limited understanding. And that's, I'm, I'm glad you said that we're not trying to exclude anything. Like the bad experiences, the difficult emotions, they're part of who we are in our human experience. And one thing that meditation has given me is the space to relax with what is and not relaxing doesn't mean like I'm just going to feel calm and not feel all the time, but it's giving me the ability to sit lately, particularly with the emotion of anger, <laughs> which is very hard. And I always suppressed, but it's given me the space to not add another layer of resistance on top of the difficult feeling of anger. Let's say that I'm already feeling, I can allow this space and capacity for it to kind of you know, move so so I can see what I'm going to do with it and how I'm going to process it and have that clarity as opposed to trying to push it away like I did uh, years ago. And obviously it didn't go away. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's there. So... Right. Um, if you try to push it away, it comes back stronger. <laughs> yeah. And stronger and stronger. So in the end, really, it pulls us down. There's no way to fight, to fight uh, that bull or that huge, strong entity, which is um, the ego. Um, uh, but the mind is really a wonderful tool. The mind can be used to um, make us understand but also it can make us confused. Same way that a knife, and I'm, I'm now I'm going to use a, a banal, if I, if I say it, so <laughs> expression that the, the knife cuts, and, and the knife is also used for ship for the knife. The main function of the knife is to cut. Now, mm -hmm. if you use, if somebody uses to cut somebody's throat, it's different than if you use a knife to cut a banana. <laughs> you know, well, mm -hmm. completely different. So there's nothing really wrong with the knife. It's the usage of the knife and the intention of the user of the knife that is the issue that we have to examine. Um, so yeah, I mean you're right in terms of in terms of meditation, in terms of experience, it um, it comes, and this is what I was saying before. At some point, things seem to happen. And perhaps what you and I are talking here is that by letting go, the issue disappears. It doesn't mean that the issue has gone away and it's not there. It just means it disappears from our own awareness. Going back to the, to the word awareness. It has disappeared from our own awareness. If it has disappeared from our awareness, then what is the point to try to uh, scalizo, as we say in Greek, what, you know, dig more and more and more, right? I mean, that's actually what uh, intellectuals do, if I permit to say <laughs> that. We dig, we like to dig, we like to dig, we like to dig. Um, you know, um, again, the great uh, Socrates was talking about the sophists. He was making fun of the sophists. He, he was not trying to argue with the sophists. He was making fun of them because, <laughs> well, you guys really, you know, they said, because they say, you know, Socrates, you, you, you really, he's using jokes. Socrates, mm -hmm. you never really, um, you, you say the same things over and over again. And Socrates would say, and Socrates would say, well, you guys would never <laughs> say the same thing. You, you know, so, <laughs> so it says, well, actually, I agree with you, but, but just you see what you're doing. You know, you, you're always wrap yourselves up mm. in, uh, sophist in sophistry, as we say, sophistry, in arguments that you cannot extract. Maybe just sit back a little bit and relax and maybe have a laugh. And I think uh, we Greeks actually have a good way to approach life, that we sit back and relax within company of each other. That is very important. I agree. 
I agree. That really helps that connection with other people. And as we're um, kind of approaching the end of our chat here, which we could talk for <laughs> for hours, hours, um, I wanted to ask if there is um, if there are any questions you think that we should ask ourselves uh, as you know humanity moves forward and as generations after generations come. What are some of the questions that you think we should ask ourselves to? I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know if I want to say evolve our consciousness because I don't know if that's the right phrasing, um, but maybe I'll make it simple. What questions should we be asking ourselves? <laughs> this is actually the, the question of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's the question that perhaps has no answer. The reason it has no answer is because it really is one's own experience. And again, when we try to codify it and say, well, this is what you should do, then becomes a problem. On the other hand, we're not going to just get away by saying, well, don't worry about it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because then, you know, Socrates said, however, make the effort. So the, the point I think we, uh, that we are talking about is, for example, laughing, like we're doing here, we're laughing, being in good company, um, being aware that well, the ego is there, but the ego is not a demon, but it's mm -hmm. something that we live with, you know. It's something that, you know, if, do we get really upset when we are dirty? Um, maybe, but it's very simple. We just get a soap and water and we wash <laughs> ourselves, you know. It's not a big deal, you know. Uh, yeah. say, oh, I'm dirty, you know, I'm going to, what's going to happen to me? So it's clearly very absurd when we talk about dirt or being dirty to make it bigger than it is. There is a solution always. So the question then is, why really is so difficult with the mind? And uh, perhaps what, what is at the bottom of this is that the tendency that we have, again, to exclude experiences of ourselves mm. um, that are always there and um, treat them as non-existence. So it, don't, it doesn't mean when we close our eyes and we say, I know you do that too as well in meditation, uh, observe your thoughts. Observe means you don't, uh, you don't really ignore them, <laughs> okay? You just look at them. You know, when we go, you know, you and I love Greece, uh, we love the sea. <laughs> when you go to the sea, you don't, you don't make a big deal out of it, right? You either mm -hmm. sit by the by the shore, right, and watch the sea, listen to the sound of the waves, or you jump in the water. It's not a big deal. You don't try to analyze what the ocean is made of, H2O and <laughs> all these molecules. <laughs> this, this is what we scientists do, and because that's our job in some ways, perhaps. But mm -hmm. when you have the experience of water, just have the experience of water. On the other hand, and this may be one of the last points I want to make today, is mm -hmm. that experience cannot be translated. You know, for example, the experience of red. I, we can sit uh, here for not just hours, but for our entire lives mm -hmm. and talk about the color red. There would be no end to the discussion. There would be many books written, uh, a lot of time wasted in the end. It's the experience of red. When I say, Oh, Dina, do you understand red? You'll say, yes, of course I do. And you, if you ask me, I'll say, yes, of course I do. But that's where it, it stops, okay? Mm. It's the experience is the same. I know you know, I know you know, or I know you feel the same red that I do, but I cannot prove it. I cannot prove the redness. I can feel the experience. And as human beings, perhaps, we stick together because we have this common um, underlying sense of reality, which is the human reality. It's not the lion's reality. <laughs> We're not trying to explain to a lion. You know, a lion is a, sticks around with lions, right? Mm -hmm. And we see lions and we see how they behave. We human beings happen to be human beings. And so things are really simpler than they appear. Again, it's a misguided ego if I can finish with that, that gets us into 
a heck of a lot of problems. This podcast is created for people like you who want to finally find out what this meditation hype is all about. The One Fierce Heart podcast is produced and hosted by me, Dina Hiropoulou. Sound editing and mixing by Matrix Recording Studio in Athens, Greece. 